Okay, so uh, our last speaker for this session is Nikolai Prakofiev. He's going to tell us about bipolar on superconductivity. Yeah, thanks Tigran and other organizers for letting me speak about what we did recently. Uh, what we found, something which I knew probably right after the high school. This was the long story about bipolar on superconductivity by Alexandrov, Mouat and many others. And what I found more recently is that not a single calculation was done quality quantitatively, which means it was all talking, 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 but not a single number anywhere for the most relevant case when you are in the adiabatic regime with phonon frequency smaller than the bandwidth, and then doing bipolarons with full numerics, so you know the effective masses, you know the sizes, and you understand how to calculate TC in the interacting body gas. None of this was ever done, even despite I don't know, numerous work about bipolar and superconductivity. So probably the first half an hour, I will simply try to create the field of how the problem should be approached and what kind of numbers you need to actually make quantitative predictions for how the bipolar and superconductivity will look like. And only at the very end, for 15 minutes, I will discuss a particular model and try to argue that you can reach transition temperature potentially which is maybe four times higher than the highest possible TC you can get from the Elyashberg state. Uh, okay, so let me start. So first, let me thank the collaborators. It's Chao Zhang, she was at UMass and now she moved to East China Normal University in Shanghai. Boris Sistanov, also from UMass. Uh, Mona Birku from Vancouver. John Sous, uh, Andrew Millis and David Reichman from Columbia. John moved to Stanford, I think. Uh, San Diego, sorry. Stanford. Uh, Barbara Capagrosa Sansona, she is at Clark University, and Massimo Benincegi from the University of Alberta. And uh, most of the results are now on the archive or published in a couple of FIDREF letters, FIDREF uh, papers. Now, the outline of the talk will be as follows The many body part of the bipolar superconductivity is more or less the easiest thing, contrary to everything else we have in the strongly coupled electronic systems. Yes, the coupling is strong, but the moment you are talking about bipolar and superconductivity, the main body aspect of the problem is probably the easiest one. And that's the one which I will try to quantify first. Well, next, once you have the many body physics under control, with only probably a small exception that you have to be sure that when you create bipolarons, they do not phase separate. This will require very hard many body calculation. So assuming that phase separation is not happening, that bipolarons behave like a bosonic liquid, Calculating TC is relatively easy. So next, I will simply just discuss what happens for bipolarons. It is a very steep competition when they form between those bipolarons being extremely heavy or very, very large. And essentially, you have to compromise between the two limits because either of them will result in a small value of TC. So you have to compromise and optimize the properties of bipolarons to have high TC so they are relatively compact and relatively light but you are never happy with both of them. Uh, and finally, just while I'll discuss at the very end, a particular model when I will claim that you potentially can reach transition temperatures as, as high as say phonon frequency divided by five. But remember that in some high pressure hydrides, omega can reach a fraction of electron volts. So divide by five and decide whether this is high enough or not. So, Point number one, if you have bosons, because bipolarons will be bos bosonic particles, if you have bosons, they don't need a mechanism to become superfluid. So no matter what you do with bosons, no matter how strong they are, they couple, they will bosonic condense and go superfluid. They will not bosonic condense, but they will go superfluid in two dimensions as well. And essentially there is very little you can do to prevent this from happening, except creating a crystal or going to a phase separated state, which is a crystal again, okay? So otherwise, it's a very robust phenomenon. For example, if you take helium-3, which is a very strongly coupled state, in terms of kind of many body physics, you have to do numerics to compute TC, you end up with a result which is only 0.7 of the transition temperature and otherwise an ideal gas, even though we are in a strongly correlated liquid. 
Okay. Uh, formally, you also have to remember that when well, uh, we talk about bosons, almost always bosons are composite particles, and even helium-4 is probably the good bound state of 14 different uh, fermionic species. So those are the two aspects which we have to worry about bipolar on superconductivity as well. That first, what is the transition temperature when you form, once you form bosons? What will be the effective mass of this boson? And how large or not compact this boson looks like? Because at some point, we'll have to stop the density. So let me first kind of go through the first point. How robust is transition temperature in the interacting bosonic gas if you change the model or change the interactions? So this is the case for three-dimensional case. I know that, well, this is easiest if I simply stay further away. So if I, I look at the three-dimensional case and I look at hard and soft spheres in the continuous space, and you say, okay, how much TC, sorry, how much TC will change? If I change the density, well, the density, I know 10 minus one, that's already more or less when the hard spheres will start touching. So you go all the way from extremely dilute gas, first transition temperature actually goes up if you increase interactions, it will rise. Well, it's big on the plot, but just look at the vertical scale. It's kind of at best maybe 6%, and then it drops, dramatic drop by another 7%. So essentially, no matter what you do with hard spheres or soft spheres from dilute limit to pretty dense gas, almost creating a liquid, transition temperature stays exactly the same as the ideal gas within the 10% accuracy, if you like. So, okay, yeah, I, I will allow you to probably go further and maybe even touching the floor, but this will be given the vertical scale, maybe 0.91. So it's pretty robust. Well, this is about the short range interactions. So we have hard spheres, soft spheres, looks good, but you say, okay, well, what happens if I have Coulomb interactions? And the answer is not much will change. So recently we did the calculation for the Coulomb gas for different values of RS, lattice and continuum. So on the lattice, we use uh, Hubbard U, for example, eight times T, strongly coupled. We can use I know, Coulomb repulsion on the nearest neighbor site is also eight, and then it decays as a Coulomb law, three-dimensional Coulomb law. So this is again TC as a function of density, starting from half filling, okay, 15% down, and then going to the dilute case, 10% uh, doping, it's close to one. Well, you go to the continuum and we can look at different values of RS. Well, for values of RS, simply just remember what is RS. So if you introduce the Bohr radius as the unit of length, then you simply measure the interparticle distance in terms of RS. So RS is a dimensional parameter giving you the volume per particle. So if I go to very, very large values of RS, that's a very, very dilute case because you have a huge volume per particle, like 25 cube. It's already a big number, so it's close to 10 minus 3. And with all the pi is probably 10 minus four. So you change density here essentially from half filling to 10 minus four. And again, you see the transition temperature barely changes within, if I just draw the line somewhere in the middle, plus minus 10%. So Coulomb interactions are also within the same picture. So if you have interacting Bose gas, short range, soft spheres, hard spheres, Coulomb interactions, strong, weak, you are still good if you estimate TC as if it's an ideal Bose gas. Now, 2D is slightly more subtle in the sense that, well, ideal Bose gas in 2D has no transition temperature. But it happens to be that the dependence on interaction, so this is the scattering length in 2D, for say for hard spheres, the dependence on interactions only is through double log divided by 2 pi. And just believe me that double log divided by 2 pi can never be large, no matter what you do. So unless, of course, your density is one boson for the solar system, then probably you feel this number. Otherwise, it's pretty much kind of almost static and nothing changes. Well, for example, this is again numerical calculation for hard disks. Well, this point is they almost touch. Maybe I know three times more in density and they will touch. But you see again, the scale of changes from, from 0.18 to 0.22 when you change the density by three orders of magnitude. Yep. Of course, there will be Vignal crystal. At very low density, there will be weak crystal. That's what I say. Okay, if it's a superfluid, don't worry. It's ideal gas, TC, 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 and then boom, weak crystal in very strong territory. Oh, this is a separate calculation. So if uh, if you do two dimensional gas, okay, let's go to the Coulomb case, just to, to finish my my story. So the story at the end of the story is if I have Coulomb gas in 2D, again, on a lattice with strong Hubbard U, strong Coulomb interaction. So you do continuum for very different values of RS. 
again, covering essentially all densities from high to low. Transition temperature barely changes relative to, say, you know, some baseline like 1.2 plus minus 10 percent for the entire range of densities and different coupling constants. And that's the way you read that, well, okay, going further in RS beyond 50, so 50 is the last point. Once you go beyond 50, you start seeing weaknesses. And that's why kind of I'm not doing anything here for, for the following reason. A direct first wave transition between the superfluid and the weakened crystal is forbidden. So you cannot even determine the phase boundary because it's intermediate kind of range of uh, coupling strengths when you have bubble phases. Because in the long range system, you cannot produce any change in density unless creating a negative surface tension. So on some scale, you will start creating a staircase of different bubble phases. And numerically, this is essentially impossible to study with huge finite size effects because it's a staircase of different uh, transitions. Okay, so because first order directly is forbidden, and it is a kind of very strong change from liquid to crystal. Yeah. Is it a Coulomb gas of bosons? Or... This is a Coulomb gas of bosons. Can you, this is continuous Coulomb gas of bosons. This is latest gas of bosons. Coulomb again. Uh, it's a uh, on-site coupling is eight. Nearest neighbor coupling is eight, and starting from this point, it's one or R. It's eight divided by R, where R is measured in terms of lattice constant. Again, the point is, all those plots are simply telling you, if you want to estimate what is the transition temperature of the interacting two-dimensional Bose gas, no matter how it's coupled, just say it's 1.2 N divided by M, and you will not be mistaken by more than 10%. In 3D, just say it's uh, 3.2, and two thirds divided by M, and you will not be mistaken by more than 10%. So that's the end of first story, which is saying the many body part, once you form bipolarons and their bosons, in a sufficiently dilute limit when you don't break bosons apart, calculating the TC for the system is very easy. Just essentially use ideal gas expressions, which may be you know, slightly changing the number a little bit because this is not ideal gas expression, but say 1.2 N divided by M, mean field dish type estimate, you are accurate. So this part is under precise control. So with all the calculations, we see that we can understand what will be TC in the interacting system. So next we have to go back to properties of bipolar runs. Okay, so I hope this message simply says, okay, well, don't have to, we don't have to, uh, to worry about what is TC once you form bosons. Yes, yep. So well, it would be a yet, uh, whether it's uh, sensitive to the dispersion of bosons. Uh, since I'm talking about more or less dilute systems, not that much in a sense that I don't feel the entire bandwidth. But this is the latest calculation. And for example, the last points are close to half feeling. You say, oh, at half feeling, probably you feel the entire dispersion relation because it's half feeling and transition temperature is, you know, half of the bandwidth. The answer is barely. You are talking about one or two percent. So if I calculate, for example, take tight binding model and calculate transition temperature for the tight binding model for the ideal gas, or k squared over double m, you will get roughly the same numbers. So it's a question about multiple mean. Well, okay, well, then if you ask Tigran whether if you change the distortion relation to the Moet lattice, then everything is completely different. Now, of course, we are talking about you know, simple parabolic behavior or simple bandwidth, simple minimum, and the minimum is at k equals zero. If you create a minimum on the circle, it's a totally different story. We don't even have bosons. Yeah, in this sense, yeah. This is a good, good point that yes, sometimes uh, even the bare dispersion is such that you completely change physics. But somehow, helium managed to deviate quite a lot, like 30%. Well, because it's already liquid on the edge of forming a crystal. And starting from those 70% of ideal TC, it just drops to a crystal. Again, I would say just given everything in the strongly coupled fermionic systems numerically, 30% is already not bad. But I'm saying if I am slightly diluted, not a liquid which is about to form a crystal, you would be sure about 10%. And this is simply removing you know, one trouble in the discussion. So don't worry about TC once you have bosons. Okay, so that's more or less the outcome of this discussion. So if you want to estimate transition temperature in the interacting Bose gas, just use this type of expression. 
And those are the numbers which I suggest for you to use within 10% accuracy. Okay. Of course, depending on circumstances, it can be slightly high, can be slightly lower, but not by much. Uh, next, probably what you have to remember is that, well, strictly speaking, when bosons form, they form as bound states of fermions, and those may have finite size. And strictly speaking, everything I discuss here, what is the transition temperature in the bosic gas at a given density, is written under the assumption that I don't break bosons apart, which means it's written for densities when bosons are not allowed to overlap. If they strongly overlap, then probably those estimates are no longer accurate as I claim. So this is only done for the sufficiently dilute case, which means I can use this type of expressions for densities all the way to the point when, say, particle density times the volume of the bosonic, of the fermionic pair, which is forming a boson, becomes a 41. Going further, probably those estimates are no, no, long, no longer reliable. But that's how you get to the estimates of what is the highest TC by the bipolar on mechanism is possible. Because I understand, of course, the higher the density, the better TC. No problem. Keep increasing the density. But at some point, I have to face density which is so high that it's either a crystal or I start breaking bosons apart and I create a fermionic soup. Okay. So remember this. And second, we are not in a continuum in condensed matter. We are living on a lattice, which means that the effective mass of a bosonic bound state will be strongly renormalized relative to the bare particle. So the bare particle mass or bare polar mass can be M already renormalized, but the bipolar mass is not double M because you did, we don't have Galilean invariance and this can be orders and orders of magnitude stronger than double M. And this has nothing to do with E equals MC squared. Okay, now you can ask uh, next question. You say, okay, what if I try to squash bosons a little bit so I create a fermionic soup? Not much is known about this particular setup, except one problem which we know for sure how well it works. It's called unitary fermi gas. We know properties from the cold atoms, but also from the calculations which are reliable within the aerobus for the unitary fermi gas. That, that's how the fermi, uh, unitary fermi gas behaves. So you have transition temperature, which you measure in terms of fermi energies. So the estimate for fermi energy is roughly the same as my ideal Bose gas temperature, up to a number, roughly close to one fifth. So that's what we know. So if we have very strong attractive interaction between the fermions, they create very compact bosons. And then the transition temperature is the same as for the ideal Bose gas, slightly going up because this is universal, weakly interacting Bose gas. The moment you kind of create finite density, temperature goes a little bit up. Then it reaches a maximum and goes down. And it was reliably computed at unitarity to be, I know, 165. Again, the difference here is not dramatic, maybe 20% between the unitary limit when bosons already completely squash each other. Everybody wants to make a bound state with everyone. So this is already beyond the overlap. So up to overlap, the transition temperature is the same as the ideal gas. That's the outcome from the unitary Fermi gas, but well, then start to the overlapping transition temperature slightly dropped, but not by much. So which means estimating the possibility for having the highest TC by bringing bosonic pairs to the edge of almost touching is probably still not spoiling the estimate for how high TC can be. Uh, probably the other point I would like to say that, well, there is nothing unusual or you would not have to freak out. If it happens, the transition temperature is higher than the binding energy of bosons. Looks kind of a little bit strange. You say, okay, yeah, well, for example, somewhere here, you have a piece which says, okay, well, there is no overlap formally. I'm just plugging numbers for unitary Fermi gas as is. It says, okay, well, you already have no overlap from very simple criterion, density times the volume per particle equals one. So that's what I call no overlap. Of course, partially there is overlap, but that's the criterion. Well, here already transition temperature is higher than the binding energy. Of course, at unitarity, binding energy goes to zero, but transition temperature is still 0.16%. In this sense, I say, okay, yeah, it's not so bad if I simply allow bosonic density to go all the way up to say, touching or getting to the dashed line when the density is roughly inverse volume per pair. So this will be my highest estimate for TC given whatever system I'm trying to solve. That's the many body physics. Uh, of course, this is in continuum and this is the only fully solved strongly coupled fermionic system I am aware of. 
Uh, on a lattice, many things can happen different from continuum. For example, I can estimate TC as going like this curve and I reach the point of touching and then you say, okay, what will happen to transition temperature after that? We don't know. It can slightly go up maybe by 50% or it will probably drop down. And if I start approaching say half filling, then it's uh, in some calculations this was observed. It's quite possible that you can create even the insulating state can be anti-ferromagnetic mode state or some other structure which is not superfluid at all. So which means if I go density all the way to have feeling, nothing is reliable. So which means all of this, which I'm trying kind of to discuss with you now is a sufficiently dilute system, which means low density of fermions, definitely far away from have feeling when I'm not responsible for what will happen in the system. Okay, so essentially everything is up to no overlap. What happens beyond that? That's questionable and requires a separate calculation. Okay, now just brief introduction. What are polarons? It's kind of trivial. So polaron is essentially a particle which is modified by its coupling to the environment. So that's the notion of the polaron. Ah, okay, here it's written like particle Hamiltonian, phonon Hamiltonian, and behind the, the image you have the interaction Hamiltonian. Well, the interaction Hamiltonian the most standard one would be that electron density couples to the displacement of atoms, maybe on the same side, maybe on different sides, which means you have a whole range of different coupling constants. Well, but the simplest model would be simply to write down the local coupling, that there is a local coupling between the electron density and the displacement of some phonon mode. Typically, people consider the optical mode, and this is known as Halstein model. For the generic model, with all kinds of couplings, probably I can even make an image. It's an electron, but if I just inject this electron, it will push atoms around. But if electron has to move, it has to drag the entire lattice deformation with it. And that's what makes it heavy. Kind of standard more or less picture. Okay. When I talk about bipolarons, I literally mean that, well, you have one electron coupled to the lattice, it will change its energy. But maybe if I have two electrons also coupled to the lattice, energetically, it's favorable for them to form a bound state. So this is a bipolaron. Once you form bipolarons, they will be condense according to the transition temperature, which I showed to you. But why I need to know properties of bipolarons. I need to know their effective mass and I need to know their size because their size will stop me from using too high densities. I cannot allow them to overlap because beyond that, I cannot control the answer. Okay, so that's essentially the, the root of estimating what is the highest possible PC I can get from the mechanism. That's how you have to proceed. We already know all the numbers in this formula in 2D and 3D. Well, now we simply go to the highest density possible and we estimate it from the density times the volume per pair equals one. And that's the final expressions. Well, you estimate volume as pi r squared in two dimensions or four pi divided by three r cubed in three dimensions. So for this, I simply have to plug in this expression or this expression. And those quantities are computable numerically. This is just mean square size of the bipolar on bound state, and I need the effective mass. So those are the estimates which I will be plotting. Well, maybe plus or minus, maybe 0.5, but okay, with 10% accuracy, those will be the numbers which I will be plotting when I estimate the highest possible PC by the bipolar on mechanism. Again, the many body part is under full control, but the final estimates, I would say, not controlled with 10% accuracy because they estimate. I simply stop the density at the point when the density times volume equals one. This is not precisely controlled, but this is a reasonable estimate. Maybe it's twice as high, maybe it's twice as low. Just so be careful with that because I'm pushing everything to the point of overlap. Okay, so that's the many body part. Now I need to understand, okay, and finish the job with computing the effective mass and R square average by simply looking at the R square average using the ground state wave function, which is behind the menu. Okay, so that's how it, uh, how it looks like, but now we're just looking at the expression, you say, oh, the following will happen for sure. Suppose I have a very shallow bound state. Very shallow bound state probably will be relatively light because the bipolar on mass by Galilean invariance now will be twice the polar on mass. It's relatively light, but huge. If it's very large in size, the moment the bipolar on forms, it's huge in size. So I cannot push its density too high. So transition temperatures will be relatively low. Well, but then you increase coupling 
and the size of the cloud will shrink so I can go to higher density you go to higher density but then the effective mass will start increasing and at some point the increase in the effective mass will be a much more important effect than making the bipolar on compact of course ultimately you'll reach say the one or two three latest spacings and you cannot push the size of the bipolar on further but the effective mass will keep increasing so you will go through a maximum which means we have to look at the optimal by optimizing effective mass times the size of the bipolar on squared and that's what will determine the best possible chance for high tc in your system okay so this is the framework for the discussion okay now i want to discuss a little bit kind of the other side of the story because bipolarons form when if electron phone uncoupling is relatively strong if it's weak forget about them you do the mcdowell ashberg theory and so the question is okay how you go from one picture to the other when you have to change mcdowell ashberg theory to the bipolar picture okay uh, and i will argue the following so if you increase the coupling constant in the mcdowell ashberg theory beyond one the following three things potentially can happen first this can be latest instability you completely restructure the lattice and then do the calculation from scratch because you will change the phonon spectrum you will change the electronic structure you will change the electron phonon coupling constants and maybe it will go back to less than one so that's one second maybe you will simply drive some insulating phase because i was showing to you that well at half healing many things can happen including an insulator well the other one which i can easily argue is very generic because the first two are lattice dependent density dependent many things depend whether one or two happens but three is trivial to compute and i can immediately claim whether this will happen or not as a variational argument so bipolar on collapse I can compute properties of a variational state and you cannot fight with variational state I simply present the energy of this variational state and it's better if it's better than the mcdowell ashberg theory forget about mcdowell ashberg theory probably it's a very strong third order phase transition which mcdowell ashberg theory will not see at the level of one diagram because you neglect vertex corrections but if you go to vertex corrections of order 20 suddenly you will discover there is a much better state but nobody does it but variationally, I can immediately establish that, well, that's the case. So that's the generic argument. And I'll kind of try to convince you that, well, okay, by going through the generic argument, I can show you that, well, you cannot cross in mcdowell ashberg theory, coupling constant lambda bigger than one, which I define in terms of bare Hamiltonian parameters. So sometimes coupling constant, people define it through the normalized parameters, which themselves are changing as you compute more and more. So in terms of bare parameters, you cannot cross lambda equals one. And I'll do this argument. Well, it's actually pretty old. If you look at the references, which I hear, this is roughly when I still was in the high school. So that's how old is the argument. So let me show you. Even though sometimes I hear from people that, well, if you do mcdowell ashberg theory for lambda much bigger than one, transition temperature goes as square root of lambda. All of this is fiction. mcdowell ashberg theory does not exist for lambda bigger than one. So let's see the, the, uh, the proof. Uh, it's the proof for the most realistic case when you have phonon frequency much smaller than the bandwidth. This is what's called adiabatic limit because atoms are much slower than electrons. Sorry, the bandwidth or the uh, thermal energy? Which energy? Thermal. Bandwidth. Yeah, you'll see. Not thermal energy, bandwidth. So that's the uh, standard definition of the coupling constant. It's uh, this is coupling between the displacement and density dimensionless displacement times density and it's divided by the bandwidth and the, the phonon frequency so that's the standard definition of the coupling constant sometimes people use different numbers but that's the number which i will use so let's start doing the calculation i will argue that okay lambda equals one will be the important one but lambda equal one is when the coupling constant is somewhere in between the large bandwidth and small phonon frequency so it's square root of the two now let's do the calculation so if i'm sitting in the band and i can do second order perturbation theory using electron phonon coupling just compute for example the energy for zero momentum state second order perturbation theory well but this integral goes all over the bandwidth there is no fermi energy i'm talking about just one electron and you can easily estimate okay well the energy will be a minus w divided by two that's half the bandwidth and some correction which is second order perturbation theory g squared typical denominator is the bandwidth and maybe some number well, but remember that well, okay, lambda one will be the important one, which means g squared divided by w 
Well, this way divided by W if lambda is one is probably on the scale of phono frequency, which is much smaller than the half bandwidth. So this term is still dominating. This is small correction as expected for the perturbation theory being valid. You say, okay, so good. Let's do the other calculation. Simply stop the electron and not don't allow this electron to move. Well, this is trivial. You just complete the squares and immediately tell me how much I gain in energy if I have a localized electron not moving. If electron is not moving, you simply gain energy, which is minus G squared divided by phonon frequency. It's standard complete the squares. Well, if it move, if it moves, if this will move, I'm just completing the squares here for you, just to be sure. <laughs> if this electron will move a little bit, you will find it will like actually exponentially heavy in this particular case, just because the overlap between the phonon clouds when you try to move the electron in the lattice. In this particular case, for lambda equal close to one, will be already exponentially heavy. But this can only lower your energy. So if I'm talking about variational state. This is already good enough. I can make it slightly better, but not a big deal. Okay, so this is simply taking care of the overlap that the localized electron can actually move because the system is translationally invariant. You compute the overlap between the two clouds, and the answer is exponential minus g squared divided by phonon frequency squared. I'm sorry about the menu, but there is nothing I can do about it. So what's written here? Maybe I can exit the uh, the show mode. Oh, it's good. Sorry. Oh, what did you do? Sorry. Ah. No, this is good enough. Just leave it. Okay, so that's the estimate for the effective hopping of this localized state, which is fully deforming the lattice. So it's this exponential. Our job is done. So this is the energy done by perturbation theory in the band. This is when I simply stop the electron and don't allow this electron to move. The energy is minus G squared divided by, or you immediately notice the denominator is omega. Here, denominator is the bandwidth. And remember that one is much bigger than the other. So you just compare the two, forget about corrections, they are very small. So you simply compare minus W divided by two, and here I have G squared divided by phonon frequency. So this one, the right-hand side one will win. The moment my coupling constant is one. <laughs> okay, now we can see everything. So that's the simple argument which says, if I have polarons, just one polaron at the band, at the bottom of the band, will decide to undergo a self-localization, call it self-localization transition at lambda equal one. Now if you have a Fermi liquid, you will start building additional energy because you have to place other electrons on top of the first one and the Fermi energy will go even up. So which means if I have a many body state with many electrons, it will collapse to localized polarons even earlier than lambda equals one. Because localized state is exact. I will just place localized electron on different sites and I'm done. And it's variational state, and for each electron, I gain energy G squared divided by omega. So I definitely win. If you have more electrons, I win more. So this will happen even earlier. Okay. Well, that's roughly how this will look like for one particle. It's a very light branch, barely renormalized. But once I reach lambda one, there is a very sharp crossover, and I go to extremely heavy branch with exponentially large mass. Because remember, my G squared divided by omega squared, if I use it in terms of lambda, lambda one is the transition point. And that's the number which is multiplying. It's the bandwidth divided by phonon frequency, which is supposed to be much bigger than one because it's a diabetic limit. So you immediately have exponentially heavy particles the moment you transition from the band, band behavior slightly to normalized to strongly uh, normalized. Now I will repeat the same argument for bipolarons. It's very easy. So if I have two polarons far away in the band, well, the combined energy is minus the bandwidth with small correction. But if I localize two electrons, spin up and spin down on one and the same side, I gain four times the previous energy. Because now density has doubled and the phonon displacement is doubled. So the energy gain is the square of this. I gain four times. Okay, so now the transition will happen at an even smaller value of lambda. 
which means my polar on collapse, which I discussed before, at the variational level, bipolar on collapse will have an even value. So if I have finite density of polarons at lambda roughly one half in the Halstein model, the state will definitely go somewhere, but it's not a family liquid type behavior. So for lambda equals one half, I already know that the variational state of localized bipolarons is already better in energy. You can estimate the bipolar on effective mass, and again, the same story, it's exponentially heavy. I, yeah. Uh, it's clear that the small lambda, the bipolar force. Is... No, no, it forms for lambda bigger than one half. Its variational argument says, okay, it will form for lambda bigger than one half. And there is no dimensionality in this argument, it's variation. So in 3D, I probably definitely need some critical value of lambda to form a bipolar on. But here I'm just simply saying it will definitely form, just don't even worry. It will definitely form for lambda bigger than one half. Yep. I cannot say that I for sure understood the question. I'm saying this is a variational argument which is saying it's one half, but if you do numerics, full numerics, probably it will be 0.463. But you can do it numerically because you can figure out, okay, when the bound state forms. I'm saying at the variational level, I proved that one half already tells you it's better. But exact solution probably will say it will happen a little bit earlier because variational energy is slightly higher than what we want. But it simply says that going to lambda much bigger than one makes no sense for the Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, well, this is happening because I'm gaining more energy if I localize uh, two particles together. Because if I have one particle localized, this is G squared divided by omega times two because there's staying far away from each other. But if I localize them on the same side, I gain four times G squared divided by omega. So placing double the density will give you four times high energy. If they hate giving them far away, this is twice as bad. And it's a very tight state because I'm gaining, and this gain in energy is already competing with the bandwidth. So it's a very good tight binding state. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, this is extremely heavy crossover because everything here, the change from light to heavy based on the exponential factors, it's very, 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 very narrow the crossover. In this region, you understand that if I have one polaron, uh, so sorry, okay, because there is actually a theorem which says if I have latest model, electron phonon coupling, energy has to be analytic function of the coupling function which means it's not avoided crossing because you say, okay, why I'm saying it's a, a crossover? Because exact crossing is not possible. There is no symmetry which says, okay, you cannot make a transition from light to heavy. Diagrammatically, I know what happens. Lowest order diagram, lowest order diagram, lowest order diagram. And suddenly in this particular parameter range, if I just do numerics, you'll see the diagrams of order one are competing with diagrams of order 40. They're fully reducible diagrams of order 40. And if you tune properly, you can see that, yeah, with equal probability, your particle wants to be either in the perturbative regime or fully dressed, very heavy region. And it's extremely narrow transition between the two. So low order and perturbation theory, you don't see anything. Else. Nothing, it's just the Ashberg theory, lower to the diagram, and you are done. And all corrections are small. Second order, even smaller. Third order, even smaller. Fifteenth order, almost negligible. And suddenly, fourth or fortieth order is competing and it's much better. Yeah. 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 No, no, yeah, I'll go to this. It's a variational state. Whatever you do better is better in energy. You have to understand the power of variational argument. It's undeniable and it's killing you. <laughs> Because obviously you say, okay, suppose I have Hubbard U, I have to increase the energy, I'll do it. Don't worry, I'm just, this will happen. No, no, because now you say, okay, the Hamiltonian is different from what we say, let's add Hubbard U, how this will behave. This will be actually hurting you because if you have Hubbard U, you will delay the formation of the bipolar. And so when it forms, it happens with the even bigger coupling constant because I have to overcome the Hubbard U 
and then it will be even heavier. But then you say, okay, how can I compare with the band theory? And then good luck, solve me the Hubbard model. Because it's easy for me kind of to argue for bipolarons with you, but uh, fully uh, interacting Hubbard you many body state of electrons, nobody actually can do it. So, okay, Actually, I'm not progressing anyway. Can you wait for the audience? No, the, the question is uh, from Andre. It's the same question we already discussed with him, but he is doing it for your, for your sake. Uh, whether I have to distinguish between the bare coupling constant, which I defined here in terms of bare parameters, and fully renormalized parameters. At the level of one or two electrons, of course, I can use bare parameters and there is nothing to renormalize further because it's zero density of electrons. If it's a many body state with finite density of electrons, sometimes the following is happening in the literature. People define the coupling constant not in terms of the bare Hamiltonian, but in terms of renormalized phonon frequency. So when the softening of the phonon mode happens, you can redefine the coupling constant by putting the renormalized phonon frequency in denominator. And this renormalized coupling can be made bigger. So this is definitely uh, the, uh, something which you have to watch. What people call the effective coupling constant. But there is also the question of double counting them because if you allow the electron phonon coupling to change the phonon spectrum, the question is how much went to the phonon spectrum in the first place? Because usually when people form the phonon spectrum, screening of Coulomb interactions is already taken care of because otherwise, for example, you don't have acoustic phonons unless you screen Coulomb interactions in the crystal, you have plasma frequencies. So some part of the electron ion interaction is already part of the phonon spectrum. So once you start doing diagrams on top with the electron phonon interaction, the question is how much has to be added or subtracted. For example, RPA was included in the phonon spectrum already, and that's how we formulate the problem which we try to solve. This is typical for migdal albert calculations. But then if you try to renormalize the on spectrum, you have to compute the polarization operator and subtract the RPA expression, which is already included in the formation of the phonon spectrum. And this is becoming kind of slightly tricky. But yes, you have to pay attention in the finite density case to the difference between the coupling constant defined in terms of renormalized spectrum relative to the coupling constant, which I define in terms of original Hamiltonian parameters. Okay? I'm talking about original Hamiltonian parameters. In my case, is zero density anyway. How much? How many slides you still have? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I probably, if I, if I don't finish, that's not important. As long as the discussion is going, I'm happy. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so essentially we have a couple of lessons. So electron phonon interaction may lead to formation of bipolarons if it's strong enough. Perturbation theory fails when the coupling constant in terms of bare Hamiltonian parameters is bigger than one for sure, maybe even much earlier, but bipolarons can be extremely heavy. Because remember the moment I form bipolarons, it's immediately the rush to claim TC because we are done with many body physics, but we have to know the effective mass. And if it's exponentially heavy, our TC is not going to be high. Probably when migdal Ryashberg theory drops to bipolarons, TC actually drops to almost zero. So that's the danger, okay? And kind of jumping a little bit ahead. So if you do the Halstein model, the answer is yes, that's precisely what will happen. So if you do migdal ashberg theory, you can reach certain values of TC, but once you start forming bipolarons and the Fermi liquid theory collapses to the BC type of theory, TC actually drops because for Halstein model, the heaviness of the effective mass is the most important effect. Okay, so this is the end of the previous decades of studies of bipolar on mechanism of high TC. As far as I see for the model, which was always discussed in the literature, it simply doesn't exist if you do numerics. Okay, uh, I will forget about Macmillan formula. Now, the change of the story was that, well, okay, Halstein coupling is not the only one you can imagine happening in materials. So let's imagine a different model. At this point, I'm not a material scientist. I'm imagining a model. So the model is that, well, okay, the interaction is happening not through the particle density, but through the particle current. In a very simple sense, I'm saying that the hopping of the particle between the nearest neighbor sites depends on some phonon displacement or atomic displacement happening somewhere on the bond. 
Okay, so that's the Hamiltonian. Uh, you can imagine two things for this to happen. For example, this was the original thinking of my uh, teachers. That, well, okay, the electron can hop from side I to side J, and there is some, for example, couple of atoms which are sitting on the tunneling path. Well, if they move away, it's much easier for the electron to, uh, to, to hop. If they are closer to each other and closer to the tunneling path, the potential barrier goes up, and then the popping matrix element is smaller. So literally saying, okay, depending on the position of those two atoms, the hopping matrix element is some exponential. This is the tunneling action, which depends on the position of black atoms. And then you simply linearize this and write down the model as one plus GX instead of this exponent. And that's how you produce this type of coupling. We found that this model is probably not the right one to think about this, because in this model, you can never go to strong coupling faithfully. When GX is bigger than one, then who told you that you can do the Taylor series expansion? And now we know this is definitely not possible. But there are other cases. For example, suppose you have the case when the electron can tunnel from I to J using two different passes. And they almost compensate each other to very small value. Now, if there is another atom which is modifying one of the passes in the superposition, you can change the superposition significantly. So that, that's how you can still rely on the Taylor series expansion for small displacements, but at the same time, change the superposition even from positive to negative, depending on the position of the atom. So that's roughly the picture which we had from one of the uh, collaborators, David Reichman, who told us, okay, this is maybe the realistic one. So the electron can tunnel, but there are different ways. You can, for example, tunnel directly or through some other atom, but there is another path to go, say through the intermediate atom. And if this atom moves up or down, this path is changing its amplitude. And if there is another one which is opposite in sign, they can compensate each other and then small changes in one can produce relatively large changes in the effective hopping. Okay, so that's the other model. It's simply kind of a picture justifying how this type of Hamiltonian can be written and taken to the strong coupling case. Now, what are the properties? I will be pretty quick in saying, okay, we do a Monte Carlo and this particular model is sign-free. We can do one electron, we can do two electrons, we can take care of the Hubbard U, we can take care of Coulomb repulsion between those two electrons, and we solve it exactly for any coupling constant for the electron phonon coupling. Why? Well, because expansion in terms of path integral for the particle, if tunneling is negative, it's a sign positive. Coupling constant to phonons always comes in pairs, so it's G squared, no sign problem from that. And you keep in the path integral, you keep all the potential interactions, Hubbard U, Coulomb interactions in the exponent. You're not doing the expansion. So this representation is sign free and you can solve it exactly. So which means we can tell you all the properties of bipolarons numerically exactly up to the arrow bars, how they form the bound state, what are the effective masses and how big they are. So the problem is completely solvable because it's sign free. So that's the Monte Carlo, which we did. Uh, we can also do it for not only for linear coupling, but for nonlinear coupling as well. And that's the result. So it's more or less the competition, which I was telling you before. So if you have, bound states this is binding energy of course it increases as you increase the coupling constant lambda well you see that well this is for phonon frequency is three times roughly three times smaller than hopping given that the bandwidth is eight so it's 20 times smaller than the bandwidth so relatively good adiabatic parameter so if you increase hubbard u of course the binding energy goes down so this is binding energy for u equals zero u equal eight u equal 12 so binding energy is dropped well, then you look at the sizes. Of course, when the binding energy drops, the state gets more and more delocalized. This is say for lambda equals 0.5, somewhere here in the middle. So of course, it's much more delocalized. And then you compute effective masses, and that's precisely what we see. On one hand, if I increase the coupling constant, bipolarons become much more compact, so I can go to higher density. But at the same time, the effective mass will explode. They become extremely heavy. So I have to work and find the proper opt uh, optimum in terms of coupling constant and Hubbard U in such a way that I have to make sure that the product of effective mass times the size squared is the best possible place. Uh, there is one piece which is kind of slightly strange at the beginning, that Hubbard U is helping S-wave superconductivity. Just if somebody says, okay, Hubbard U is hurting S-wave superconductivity, just don't believe them. For a very simple reason, I'm giving you the mechanism. Suppose I have a state somewhere for u equals zero, but it's kind of too compact. Because it's compact, it's very heavy. And then Tc is small. 
because it's all heavy. You give me Hubbard U, Hubbard U will make the pair extended. It will increase in size. But if the bipolaron state is getting bigger, it's much, much lighter. So for very simple reason, you just start pushing electrons away from each other. It's kind of much easier for them kind of to move around. And the decrease in the effective mass is the most important effect at this point. And you, sorry, you increase the Hubbard U and the transition temperature goes up. And you can do it for different adiabatic parameters from phonon frequency as I know. 0.2 popping, I know, three times smaller, two times smaller, depending on different coupling constants. You see, okay, if I fix coupling constant, I can tune the Hubbard U. Of course, this was kind of for the design. The Q equal eight, for example, will happen to be the optimum, simply because it will optimize the size and the effective mass of the bipolar mechanism. So essentially, Hubbard U is not hurting you. Depending on the circumstances, it can be actually to your advantage to produce SVX superconductive with relatively high TC because of the Hubbard U. Otherwise, it would be too heavy. Uh, and this is more or less the final plot, which summarizes the entire discussion that in this particular model, now, why this model is different from the Halstein one? Halstein model gains energy locally. I need two electrons on the same side to gain the most. But Hubbard U is on the same side. So I am directly competing between phonon energy and Hubbard U on the same side. So to overcome the Hubbard U, I have to make a much bigger displacement in the phonon field. In the bond polaron, I gain energy from the phonon field by moving. So electrons can easily move on the plaquette, enjoy energy from the hopping. That's how they gain phonon energy. And at the same time, they avoid each other. So I'm much more tolerant to the Hubbard U at this point. And that's the summary. So essentially, by optimizing parameters for lambda, different values. Here, U was simply fixed to be eight. We simply look, okay, what is the highest possible transition temperature? If I do, say, Migdal-Eliasberg theory, this is Migdal-Eliasberg theory when the coupling is of the bond polaron type. And the other curve is Migdal-Eliasberg theory when the coupling is the Halstein type. And you see, okay, this is curve number one, and this is curve number two, but they never cross phonon frequency divided by 20. Here I am using the bare coupling constant lambda, but you immediately see, okay, why it goes through the maximum and goes down instead of increasing the square root of lambda. That's because I'm plotting TC as a fraction divided by the original phonon frequency omega. So formally, in terms of renormalized phonon frequency, probably TC goes up, but renormalized phonon frequency it drops down. So in absolute terms, TC goes down. Okay, so going to strong coupling limit in this migdal Ashberg theory, we actually see the, the drop. And it's actually a relatively small number. If I do the Halstein model without any Hubbard, uh, Hubbard U was there, it's still kind of more or less at the same limit, but typically it's smaller. But if we do bond polarons, we can increase this number roughly by a factor of five, four. So which means according to our calculations for bond polarons, we are in a much better place in terms of having compact bosons relatively light they're not very light but relatively light so we can reach transition temperatures which are phonon frequency divided by five so it's a much better case to have let's call it non-local electron phonon coupling it's to your advantage kind of in terms of the bipolar mechanism of superconductivity okay i'll probably stop at this so bond polarons can be made relatively compact at light and light and possibly reach your transition temperatures divided by frequency or the phonon frequency divided by five Again, in some materials with hydrogen uh, modes, probably this can be, I know, even at the scale of 100 Kelvin. I'm not that optimistic, but it's a dream material. So formally, in terms of engineering, what would you want? Of course, you want the higher omega, the better. Uh, but we also see that typically the maximum we can reach depends on the ratio between omega and T. And if this ratio is very, very small, usually it's extremely hard. That's the argument which I started in the first place. In the extreme limit of omega much smaller than T, effective masses are just exponentially heavy, and there is very little you can do about it. This will not help you. So having this ratio relatively large, 0.5 is okay, 0.3 is okay, the higher the better. So which means probably if the phonon frequency is fixed, you need a material which looks like a tight binding model with smaller values of T. So you can optimize the value of T. Okay, so that's how the, uh, whether you have Hubbard U, you don't have to worry much. Hubbard U, you can tolerate even relatively high Hubbard. Uh, recently, we did also calculations how much of all of this will change if I also include long range Coulomb repulsion between the bipolarons. Uh, in terms of many body physics, we already discussed it, nothing will change. 
But in terms of the binding states, how heavy, how compact, this will change. And the transition temperature does drop by a factor of two or three if you include the relatively strong Coulomb repulsion long range. Obviously, because I need much stronger electron phonon coupling to overcome the repulsion coming from the Coulomb piece. And this makes my bipolarons heavier, but still uh, definitely competing with the McDowell Yeah, yeah, I'll stop. Question. So the numerics that you were showing that was for two dimensions? Uh, yeah. Right now we have three. This one was two dimensions. Okay. Three dimensions have even higher value of the heat. I see. High ratio, but not much. So this ratio, for example, was 0.2, I think. Uh, in 3D, if I don't include Coulomb repulsion, it can go to 0.25. But, not a big difference but there you were saying that you need the critical value of lambda yes and still beyond this critical value of lambda well those lambdas are also not small so strictly speaking you can wonder whether bipolarons in 2d always form for very small values of lambda yes but they are outrageously large in size and completely irrelevant for tcs so this is some way here they're too big uh -huh. well so you still go to relatively large values of lambda in 3d you need a critical value once they form you can still kind of have TC on the scale of 0.25. Thank you. Uh, Colin, sorry for a dumb question. Uh, I, I guess there, there is no Anderson theorem for uh, bipolar and mechanism. So disorder will, will, will be. Okay, this is a different story which I didn't show. Bosons don't care about disorder at all. Okay. So essentially, uh, whenever we studied how we transition temperature in the Bose system, interacting Bose system, and the interacting Bose system will depend on disorder. Whatever is happening, you go to the Yoffe Regal limit, essentially, disorder is such that scattering length is the interparticle distance or atomic distance. TC will barely change by one or two percent. You really have to go almost to molecularization. So that at the single particle level, you want to localize everything and beyond that, and only then TC will probably start suffering a little bit. But, but bosons are living close to the bottom of, of your band, yeah. so it seems to be very easy to localize. Them. Oh, no, but then you have disorder, which is uh, kind of relatively strong and probably supporting bound states for them. Yeah, no, in this sense, I agree. If they're heavy, well, probably, yes, I agree. So I, I have to remember that while well, they can be so heavy that even weak potentials can localize them. In this sense, yes. But I have to be close to the localization transition. If you okay, well, let me kind of say something else. Sometimes you see the following outrageously strong design. I don't have it for the lattice. So we, we did calculations for interacting bosons with very strong disorder and try to understand, okay, how you modify properties of the superfluid. The following will happen. You have a very strong potential. You say, oh, I will localize the boson. Good for you. It goes there. The second one will go to the potential well where this previous boson is sitting, but they are repulsive. It's more shallow. The bosons will simply feel your potential. And the moment you have enough bosons, if you have more impurities than bosons, yes, what can I do? You didn't even dope my system, sorry. But if the system is doped in the sense that, well, okay, you have less impurities than the number of bipolarons, they will not care about your strong disorder at all. They will fill out all the bound states to the point when the chemical potential is getting delocalized, kind of above zero, and they will go super good. They're just outrageously good in screening. So there's no positive. In this sense, yes, there is no positive map, there is only positive super good. But this is Ethereum, for example, there is no Bose metal because if you have, say, conventional dispersion relation, conventional repulsive interactions, it's a, a sign positive representation for the density matrix, which means whatever you compute, your density matrix is always positive, but it has no sign cancellation. And then you can show that, well, okay, metal is not possible because you have always positive contributions to superfluid density. Yeah, so it's, it goes superfluid outrageously well. Unless your impurities will simply kill all the bosons. Yeah, good question. Uh, so when you talk about this uh, bond Hausstein model uh, in the presence of repulsive interaction, either Hubbard or uh, Coulomb interaction, yeah. uh, did you look for a pairing in non S wave channel? Uh, we didn't. So it's, 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 no, we, we didn't for probably very simple reason because uh, 
singlet well first we are not suffering from hubbard u because we can avoid uh, two particles sitting on the same side because they gain energy by hopping in the high in the Halstein model you're right this was done before even before us in the Halstein model if you have very strong hubbard u you will trigger the transition that now triplet by polaron is better than the singlet one because you kill singlet because uh, the repulsion is uh, kind of high, give you high energy for the singlet then you have it for the triplet because triplet will avoid hubbard u anyway so yeah that's the case so for the Halstein model with local coupling to phonons yes triplet can win over the singlet for sufficiently large u so this is happening But again, it's triplet BC. So somewhat related question. But I, so if I add magnetic field now to this model that you show the results for, right? Uh, so that to go effectively imagined fully polarized linear. So what did it do? So that uh, I avoid, don't know. But I mean, no, you change the Hamiltonian. Now you have no, 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 no But I mean, I'm so. Okay, one okay. intuition. Uh, so my intuition, no, no, my intuition would be since I well, some of some of the calculations were done for u equals infinity. So given that for u equal infinity, I can still have bound states and they're still relatively light and everything. I would say that probably I will not suffer that much if you polarize everything. If you polarize everything, okay, I will have a triplet state, but they can avoid each other anyway when u is infinity. So I would say probably some of the numbers will survive. But we did not didn't do the calculation, so. I would not say it will be the same. So maybe the answers will change by effect of two or three. I think yes, because infinite U is still doable and it's still roughly the same properties. Well, you have seen some of the pictures, they were U equal 12, not, not a big deal. A question from Andrei Chubukov. Is the difference with Eliashberg theory the same for U equal to zero? Uh, I'm not sure I understand because there is no Eliasberg theory for non zero U. There is only Eliasberg theory for U equals zero when you don't care about electron electron interactions direct. I'm not sure I understand the question. Because with this Migdal Eliasberg theory, as written, it was done for U equals zero. So probably that's how I have to interpret. In this plot, U equals eight was done for bipolar mechanisms. That's when U equals eight was included. When we did migdal Lashberg theory, it means we didn't care about U at all. It was U equal zero. So which means for very large Hubbard repulsion, we have S-wave superconductive with much higher temperature than you have for U equal zero in migdal Lashberg theory. U equals eight is only for bipolar on mechanisms. For migdal Lashberg theory, there is no U. It's U equal zero. So about uh, phase separation, you said that you're not going to mention it, but in the Holstein case, there is a tendency towards phase separation at large couple. Yeah, it's possible. So we did not discuss it. Yeah. Is, but is there a reason why that should be less of an issue in the... Uh, definitely not. Phase? Yeah, definitely not an issue if we have a long range Coulomb repulsion, because only the microstructure, quality crystal is possible. And yes, our numbers are still kind of relatively good, maybe not as good as I was showing, but still good enough compared to Migdala Lashberg. If you have long range Coulomb repulsion, then phase separation is completely closed. Uh, whether you have phase separation for some of the coupling parameters uh, which we studied, I cannot answer because we didn't solve kind of this type of, say, four bipolarons, two bipolarons, or four bipolarons, just to see whether they want to form a bigger cluster. We didn't do this calculation. The calculation was done at the bipolar level. So we cannot answer this question. So there is a possibility, but in the Coulomb case, it's ruled out. So if you want to talk about realistic materials, probably no. Any more questions? Okay, so let's thank Nikolai. Now we have, uh, according to the, yeah, um, is there a discussion session or we just skip it? Uh, uh, we just had it. We just had it. But if there are any question to Max or to Paula, uh, that's urgent right now. Not then, then let's.